Fox News Special Report. Good afternoon from New York. I'm Shepard Smith on the Fox News deck, and this is special coverage of the O.J. Simpson parole hearing on Fox News Channel and Fox Television stations. A live look at the parole board room in Carson City, Nevada. Four commissioners are about to decide whether Orenthal James Simpson walks free on parole or stays behind bars. He's been locked up for nine years now after a jury convicted him of felony charges related to a robbery at a hotel room in Las Vegas. It was a stunning fall for a man who dodged a murder conviction in the trial of a century. Mr. Simpson is a wanted murder suspect. Then the white Bronco. Just throw the gun out the window. OJ on the run after the death of his ex-wife and her friend. All I did was love him, All I did was love him. His trial lasted nearly a year. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And they did. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant or Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder. The wrongful death case ended differently, but for years, relative quiet. Until that night in Vegas, O.J. Simpson said he tried to get back memorabilia from collectors. Cops called it a crime. I didn't mean to steal anything from anybody, and I didn't know I was doing anything illegal. And the judge sent the juice to prison. Which leads us here. A live look now, the medium security prison from which O.J. Simpson will appear on video conference. We're expecting his parole hearing to begin at any moment. He's sentencing, he's serving now a sentence of 9 to 33 years for his role in that armed robbery of two sports memorabilia agents at a Las Vegas hotel room in 2007. The commissioners are speaking. Let's listen. O.J. Simpson's defense argued that he was just trying to get back things that belonged to him, but the jury did not buy it. O.J. is scheduled to face the same four board members who, in 2013, granted him parole on some of the charges on which a jury convicted him. Now the board is to consider paroling him on the remaining counts. We expect a ruling today, potentially within the next hour. And there O.J. Simpson is now, walking into the courtroom or into the, at the prison there, at the age of 70, smiling ear to ear. And here we go. Thank you. And um, you are Orenthal James Simpson? Uh, correct. And Mr. Simpson, will you please give me your NDOC number for the record? Um, 1027-820. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Simpson. And you're represented by whom this morning? Malcolm Laverne, my attorney. Attorney. Okay, and welcome, Mr. Laverne. Mr. Simpson, the first thing I'm going to do is put on the record your notice of this hearing and advisement of rights and ask you if you will recognize your signature for me, please. Yes, I believe. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Having recognized your signature, I'll declare for the record that you've been properly noticed and we'll go forward. I'm Chairman Bisbee. Okay. With me this morning to the right is Commissioner Andal. To my left is Commissioner Sir. Jackson. And then to her left is Commissioner Corda. We're seeing you this morning Sir. on an aggregated case sentence, and that is cases number C237890, count nine, assault with a deadly weapon, C237890, count six, use of deadly weapon enhancement, C237890, count ten, assault with a deadly weapon, C237890, count five, use of a deadly weapon enhancement, C237890, count eight, use of a deadly weapon enhancement. C237890, count seven, use of a de deadly weapon enhancement. And one of the things I want you to make, to make you aware, those um, enhancements include both to the kidnapping and the robbery charges, even though they're not necessarily the way I've said it, um, make that clear. And a caseworker, LaFleur, okay. I have a parole eligibility date of October 1, 2017, with a current expiration date of September 29, 2022. Is that correct? That is correct. I have a parole eligibility date of October 1, 2017, 
and expiration date of September 29, 2020. Now, at this point, Caseworker LaFleur, is there anything that would change that parole eligibility date? That parole eligibility date is not going to change. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Simpson, you are getting the same hearing that everyone else gets. I, I want to make that clear from the from the get go. However, since we have a crowd of people sure. here that have not um, taken advantage of our public meetings before in order to attend a hearing, some of the things I'm going to say uh, are going to get a late, little bit lengthy. So you will understand everything, but it will be okay. new information for some other folks. So just wanted to let you know that from the get go. So I, I will Thank tell you. you that as, an, as appointed members of the Nevada Board of Parole Commissioners, we have an ethical duty to consider each inmate for parole in a fair and consistent manner. Like other parole boards across the, the country, our responsibilities include needing to balance prisoner re rehabilitation with public safety, as well as taking action that considers the interests of justice. So that's what we're doing here this morning. We have adopted a guideline to assist us in making consistent decisions. We apply the elements and factors of our guideline to each inmate being considered for parole. A component of the guideline is our risk assessment. The board uses a scientifically developed validated risk assessment as part of its parole guideline. The risk assessment helps us determine which inmates are more or less likely to return to prison if we release them on parole. Using a risk assessment is not unique to Nevada as a number of other state parole boards also use them. We have revalidated our assessment three separate times in the past 14 years and it has consistently shown to be predictive. Using this risk assessment has significantly improved our overall performance. I'm going to go over each of those items with the, of the risk assessment with you at this time. And just as an aside, um, this risk assessment is being revalidated even as we speak by um, the JFA Institute. So it's pretty darn predictive is the bottom, bottom line here. So my first question for you, Mr. Simpson, were you arrested for the first time at the age of 24 or older? Um, I, was arrested for the, I was arrested for the first time, I think, at the age of 46 or 47. You were over the age of 24? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I, am I correct that you have never been on parole or probation before, therefore you have never had a parole or probation revocation? Revocation. Uh, that is correct. Okay. And I have that you are, were unemployed at the time of this offense because you were in retirement status. Status. That's correct, yes. Right, yes. Okay. Now, this is a property in conviction. It, um, we're currently hearing you on the robberies and the enhancements. And um, so you have been assessed as a property offender. Now, we've also assessed you as having a substance abuse problem. I'll tell you why that is. Um, you have indicated also in the past that um, alcohol had a big factor in this particular crime. And the fact that you have spent the last almost nine years in prison because of an alcohol-related incident would be indicative of having some sort of a, a, at least temporary substance abuse problem. So we have scored you with having some history there. Um, um, we have Ms. Mayo. And we have that you are currently, well, very recently turned 90 years old. No. old. 90, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I feel like it, though. <laughs> How about we take two decades off and call you 70? <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Um, we don't have you as having any gang affiliation, nor has the NDOC found you to have any uh, gang involvement. Note that you have completed one of the vocational trainings in um, having completed the computer application course. We note that you have not had any disciplinaries, either current or pending, and that you're currently medium level there at um, Lovelock Correctional Center. Would you say that all of those items are correct, sir? Correct, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, you do score out. The, your risk score scores you in a low, um, a low risk. However, because of your particular offense, that severity is the highest. When we combine your risk score along with your offense severity, our guideline recommendations are that we consider factors. Now, what consider factors means is we consider everything. 
in terms of, of whether or not you're a risk to um, reoffend and return to, to our criminal justice system. And so what we do at this point, um, when we're looking at the risk score, we also look like at what are called aggravating and mitigating factors. Now, aggravating and mitigating factors don't include everything in the world. They're very specific as to what we consider under, under those items also. So under the aggravating and mitigating factors in your particular case, we have mitigating or positive things for considering you for parole is the fact that you've been disciplinary free throughout your entire period of incarceration. You don't have any prior conviction history. You have community and family support. Um, you have what appears to be stable release plans. You have participated in programming, um, some rather significant programming. On the aggravating factors, and the only thing that fits under our aggravating ca characteristics in terms of risk in your situation is that at the time of this offense, your victims um, indicated that they were in fear for their safety, um, having been threatened with a gun during the commission of a crime. So those are the risk, aggravating, mitigating things we are considering. That's your overall risk score. Right now, I'm going to stop talking for a while and ask the members of the panel if they might have any questions of you. Yeah, Mr. Simpson, you've lived most of your life in the public spotlight. Yet you go into a hotel room <laughs> in Las Vegas, bring along four other men with you. Two of them are armed and rob the two victims of property. What were you thinking? <laughs> well, uh, I'm, this might be a, a little long. I don't, uh, I'll try to be Go brief ahead. with it. Um, I had been contacted by a man named uh, Riccio. Uh, he had contacted me over a period of time, told me that there was some guys that was trying to get him to fence my property, uh, and he thought I should come and get it. Well, I kind of blew him off because I'm really not interested in football property. Uh, I don't collect memorabilia, only my own personal items. He was pretty persistent in calling me, and finally I told him, well, see if you get pictures of what they have. He sent me some pictures, and what I saw was my family, my mother's albums, pictures of my kids growing up, uh, certificates of accomplishments of mine, uh, uh, pictures of what I call significant uh, famous people. Uh, letters of myself, so I told him I would really like to get this stuff. So after um, after a period of time, through what he described in court as uh, as the perfect storm, we all ended up in Las Vegas. <laughs> you know, I was there for a wedding, and he told me that the property was there, and would I like to try to get the property? I said, of course, I would like to get the property. He told me the names of what he thought were the people in the room. And I realized these are friends of mine, you know, uh, actually guys who uh, helped me move, helped me move and store some of this stuff, right? So on the day of this incident, he came to my uh, hotel uh, to talk about how this would take place. I told him I met with a lawyer last night and my sister and my daughter and some other friends and discussed it. I pointed out another lawyer that was uh, at the poolside as a part of this um, wedding party that was going on. I said, I discussed with him, and they told me that I can't do this if we're going to their home or even to their storage. OJ, uh, you cannot go in there because if they ask you to leave, you got to leave. I said, Risho, you got to get him to bring it to a public place. He said, well, let me see what I can do. Uh, all of this has been testified to, so I'm not just going, you know. Uh, he called me and told me he told them to bring it to his room, and he's going to have it brought to his hotel, and uh, would I come and get it? I said, of course I'll come and get it. He says, a lot of stuff, OJ. You better bring some friends. Well, I, could, I had a couple of friends there at the wedding that was going to go with me. He also said you should bring security. And I said, well, I know these guys. Uh, uh, I don't think I need any security. I mean, it turns out that one of the guys, uh, uh, Bruce here, I didn't know it was him. I thought it was another guy named Mike, uh, a friend of his, an ex-partner of his. But I said, I don't need any security. 
Well, later that day, when they arrived at his hotel and spread it out my, my property, he called and he said, uh, they're here. You come here, I'll meet you in the lobby. Um, and you need security, OJ. This guy, um, Beardsley, big guy. And a little, yeah, he's a little weird. <laughs> you know, I think anybody that knows him knows he's a little different. I still told him this guy is not dangerous, man. But he says, man, bring some security. During the day when he was there, he met people from the wedding. And one guy, McClinton, said he did security in Las Vegas. And it would help his business if he could have me as a client. I told him I didn't need him. But after he insisted that I bring security, I said, I can use your help. I went to the hotel. I met Mr. Riccio in the lobby. The two guys, they also met us there, which was a big mistake, obviously. I realized that um, quite soon after this. And Mr. Riccio led us to his room, uh, put the key in the door, and let us in. I know I've seen the last two or three days uh, the media reporting we broke in the room. Well, we didn't break in any room. Mr. Riccio brought us into that room. When I came into the room, I, I noticed spread out everywhere <laughs> was my personal property. You know, the only thing I saw that was on display that wasn't mine was some baseballs. And I made it clear to everybody, those are not mine. All I want is my property. And I, I think there's a tape of it. You hear me on at least three or four occasions say, I just want my property. Go forward and try to make it a little quicker. Uh, at some point, we started, when we were leaving the room, actually, I was being pushed out of the room by the security guys. Uh, because while I was in there and I recognized uh, um, uh, Bruce was there, I was surprised to see him as he testified. I was shocked, really, to see him. Uh, Bruce has been a friend of mine. He's traveled with me. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of business together over the years. And he and I said, man, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, He explained to me why he was there and why he had my property there. And uh, I told him, but geez, you should have told me. Um, uh, I accepted. I understood why. You know, it was it was the 06, 07. People were losing their homes. A guy owed him money, couldn't pay him the money, gave him my property to sell. I told him I understood that, but you still should have told me. We had a chance to talk about this at a later date, and uh, um, I he apologized. I accepted his apology. I apologized for these two guys that got pointed a gun at him. He's traveled with me. He's known me when I've had security. He's known me when the venue has supplied security. And there were times he even had to act as security for me. He knows I would never, ever direct anybody to point a gun at him or even threaten him. I've never done this in my life. I want to point out, you mentioned all those gun charges, uh, 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 Bruce and uh, Alfred. They made it clear during the trial that I had no weapon. They didn't feel threatened by me, and I, from what you said, and, they, and that I didn't threaten them. It was the other two security guys that did that. And I'm not, I haven't made any excuses in the nine years that I've been here, and I'm not trying to make an excuse now. They were there because of me, you know. But uh, in, in no way, shape, or form uh, did I wish them any harm. As I was leaving the room, and this was on the tape too, Bruce said, OJ, uh, hey man, there's a box that's with that stuff, they're Montana uh, prints, those don't belong to you. Those are mine, man. He told me that because he recognized everything else that I took out of that room was mine, <laughs> you know? And he also recognized that I wasn't there to steal that stuff, and he knew I would re re I attempted to do. I told him, we'll leave it at the desk. I'll send you stuff at the desk. He didn't know at the time that this security guy, Walter Alexander, had stole his Blackberry, you know, phone book. The minute I saw that, I made him send it back, and he gave some cockamamie story in the in, in, in the trial that uh, why he didn't take it back. In any event, um, I'm no danger to pull a gun on anybody. <laughs> you know, I never have in my life. I've never been accused of it in my life. Uh, nobody's ever accused me of pulling any weapon on them. And Bruce, uh, Bruce knows that I would never do that. I, I never have. Um, I want to also, as a postscript, add that, you know, when I got to Lovelock, the state of California took up the issue of whose property it was. They did an investigation. And they came to the conclusion that it was my property. They turned it over to me. I have it now, <laughs> you know? 
So, I mean, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling uh, that um, um, they turn over to me property that I'm in jail for for trying to retrieve. <laughs> you know, it's, it was my property. I wasn't there to steal from anybody. And I would never, ever pull a weapon on anybody. The property was yours. It's been ruled legally by the state of California that it was my property, and they've given it to me. I have it. You, that's yeah. why you went into the, to the uh, hotel oh, room. Yeah, because, yes, you, sir. because you believed in the property. Is that right? Do you yeah. know, I, I, whenever he was just telling me, when Mauricio was calling me, just telling me this, I wasn't interested. It wasn't until he got actual pictures of what they supposedly had, and because it was family photos and stuff, that's when I uh, got interested in going there, and I only went there to, to retrieve my own property. So what were you thinking when the guns were being brandished? Well, I didn't see the guns brandished. I, 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 I didn't see, uh, you say guns, uh, as I understand it, one guy who's behind me somewhere uh, pointed a gun at him. So I, I never saw him brandish a gun. When I left here, I called back to the room to ask Bruce, uh, you said that there was some pictures, what do you have? And I asked him, did this Walter Alexander return his cell phone? He told me no, and he says, OJ, wasn't cool that guy pointed a gun at me. I said, who pointed a gun at you? He says that he kind of described who it was. And to be honest, I didn't really believe him at the time. I asked the three guys I was with, they all said they didn't see him do it. I got back to my hotel. We waited for these two security guys to show up. And the minute they drove up, the first thing I said, man, did you pull a gun in that room? And he swore to high heaven, he didn't. And I asked Walter Alexander for the cell phone, and he kind of threw the cell phone to me. But, but I, I wasn't aware until, until I was in the car driving back to our hotel that this guy had actually pointed a gun at him. Now, earlier in the day when he had, uh, when he was um, talking to me, trying to get me to let him come, I, I didn't hire him. He said it was for free and all of that. He did show me. I didn't know this guy. <laughs> you know, I knew the Alexander guy, but I didn't know this guy. He showed me his license. He showed me his CCR. You know, I would assume that state gives a guy a CCR and stuff. They, they vetted him. Uh, I should have vetted him. I, should, I, I didn't really need him. I knew these guys weren't dangerous. Right. Well, no, your so, version, that, that your was version of me. the offenses differ a little bit about the official records, uh, Mr. Simpson. But uh, moving <laughs> forward here, um, considering the fact that what we have on record, weapons yeah. were brandished, you were there, property was taken. Oh, I was there. I mean, so, I'm sorry. So the question is yeah. for you is what do you think was the impact on your victims? Well, uh, I know what the impact was. I mean, we've talked about it. I mean, Mr. Uh, Beardsley, we had long talks back then. He, uh, he told me that he had tried to call my lawyer. He testified in court that he had called my lawyers and tried to tell them in the months previous that guys had my property and they were trying to sell them, but my lawyer never called him back. He actually testified for me, I, I'm sure you know, uh, uh, during the trial. Um, uh, Bruce uh, and I talked, and you know, Bruce was traumatized by, by it. Fortunately, as I said, we talked it out. He knew that uh, I would have never condoned uh, what happened. Uh, he accepted my apology, and uh, I told him that these guys should be put in jail. If they did that, you know, I wasn't going to defend them. Uh, unfortunately, um, they got to get out of jail free card when they say OJ told me. Nothing I could do about that. <laughs> but I, I want to point out that, uh, you know, Bruce, I knew his family. I mean, I, I, when his mother was terminally ill, I'd, I'd call, she was a fan, I'd call her and sing to her. Uh, the night before or the night of my, uh, the, the jury's verdict, his son actually called me and tried to give me a head up on something to do with memorabilia and told me that he and his mother was cheering for me. You know, these, this family knows that I wouldn't wish any harm on these guys, ever. These guys are friends of mine, and I'd like to think we're friends again. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Simpson. 
I conducted your last hearing in, 2000, um, in 2013 with hearing representative, Mr. Robin Bates. You recall that hearing? Yes, I do. All right. At the time, uh, we asked you what your plan would be if we were to grant you to your consecutive sentence. And you told us that you were going to complete commitment to change. Have you done that? No, I haven't. Uh, no, I have. At one point, I couldn't take the course. You know, I took, I took two courses uh, that I guess you guys don't give much credit to. It's called uh, Alternative to Violence. I think it's the most important course anybody in this prison can take because it teaches you how to deal with conflict through conversation. I've been asked many, many times here to mediate conflicts between individuals and groups. Uh, and it gave me so many tools uh, how to use it to, to, you know, to try to sh walk these guys through, you know, not throwing punches at one another. Also, uh, at one point, a couple of guys came to me and they said, OJ, uh, I understand you're a Baptist. Uh, we're Baptists and we have no Baptist service here. Can you help us get a Baptist service here? I worked with them. We now have an ongoing Baptist service that I had as well attended. I attended uh, religiously and plenty is intended. Uh, and I realized in my nine years here that I was a good guy on the street. I'm sure when Bruce came here, he'll tell you I was always a good guy. But I could have been a better Christian, and my commitment to change it was to be a better Christian. All right, thank you. Well, we do know that you've programmed over your term of incarceration. Uh, you have completed victim empathy, alternative to violence, both basic and advanced, and computer application. I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about victim empathy and alternative to violence, and how it will benefit you in the future. Well, as I said, the alternative to, to, to violence courses, I've always thought I was, I've been pretty good with people, and uh, I have basically have spent a conflict-free life. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a guy that ever got into fights on the street and uh, with the public and everybody, but as I said, uh, they give you a bunch of little tools about how to talk to people uh, instead of fighting, instead of throwing punches, tools that I've used uh, here that, you know, is how you talk to people, it's the tone that you use. Uh, the victim empathy was, uh, once again, I, I, I didn't really see that, uh, uh, in this case, I didn't really see that uh, Alfred Beardsley was, nah, was really affected by it all, but Bruce was affected. You know, Bruce was, uh, uh, I saw that he was affected, and as I said, I, I would have done anything, anything not to have that happen. For no, if for no other reason, uh, um, I regret this because he had to have this guy point a gun at him. And he told me, he said, man, the guy put a gun in my face. You know, and I said, I didn't, as I said in the beginning, I didn't believe it, but I, I know it's to be a, to be a fact now. So, um, you know, in that, that empathy course, it, it pretty much tells the guys uh, who's all there, uh, you know, they have you talk to your victim and, and what would you say to them, uh, you know, if you were to uh, see him now and for you to take, you know, responsibility for what you did and to recognize how it affected their lives. As I said, Bruce expressed to me how it affected him and uh, I, as I told him, I couldn't be more apologetic for, 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 going through, for him going through that. Thank you. I know that alcohol was a factor in the instant offense. Um, have you addressed this issue as you stated you would? Well, you know, it's, it, I think I made it clear back then, I've never had an alcohol problem. And if I took that alcohol course, it would have been more, you know, in, for my children in case they ended up having a problem. Well, my kids don't have a problem. I don't think anybody's ever accused me of having an alcohol problem or any kind of substance problem. Uh, of course, on that day, uh, I, I had drinks on that day, but it was a wedding celebration. Uh, but I, I, I never had a, a, a substance problem at all. So I didn't. <laughs> Okay, well, you told us in our we're going to attend AA, and that's the reason for my question. Uh, was a factor in the instant yes, offense. I know. Hadn't you been drinking that day? Yeah, yes, as I said, we were celebrating a, a wedding thing. I felt that the alternative to violence course and my uh, involvement with the church, uh, I also as recently became uh, the commissioner of the softball league, 18-team uh, league. Uh, my my primary uh, 
my primary responsibility was rules enforcement and, uh, you know, uh, player um, uh, deportment. You know, guys is hot. The guys play. They argue. My job is that they get surly with one another to, to remove them from the game. And if it goes beyond that, to go to Coach Fraley and have them suspended. I've never got any bow back from the guys because they know that I, I've done the best that I can. And I'm just trying to keep them out, out of trouble. So my, my, um, my agenda was full, you know, here. I've been active, totally active uh, in all the years that I've been here. I don't have much time to sit around and do anything. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, so of all of the programs that you've had an opportunity to, to complete, what do you believe is the most significant for you personally? Well, for me personally, it was the alternative to violence. As I said, I think that should be mandatory for every inmate here. <laughs> you know, once again, guys get hot here and, you know, we've had our share of fights here. And, and uh, as I said, I've been called in sometimes to try to keep guys from fighting. And then you have groups, you know, it's the Serenios, the fighting, the, the Northtown boys, they all, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. And most of the time it's over something really, really stupid. You know, in a basketball game, somebody will say something to somebody or somebody will go to somebody to complain to them about it. And it's how they complain to them about it that actually initiated the, the the conflict, you know, the fights. So uh, I, I, for the life of me, I, 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 I don't understand why that is not a mandatory course for everybody here. Um, um, excuse me, <laughs> my mind is uh, trying to think of uh, other things, but that, that's, that's the course that I would recommend to everybody. I mean, I took a, I took a computer course here, not because I'm I was computer illiterate, but I took the computer course because I, I sometimes I could never get my kids on the phone, but if you text them or send something to them on a the computer, you can get them. So I, I actually took that course so I could better communicate with my children. All right, and uh, have these programs prepared you to return to the community setting? I believe so. You know, I look. I, uh, I've missed a lot of time, like 36 birthdays with my, with my children. And, you know, I spent the 12 years leading up to this incident in Vegas raising two kids in, 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 uh, in, in L.A. I mean, I'm sorry, in Miami. And, you know, with all the media stuff, you know, we got these guys like Jeffrey Felix making up stories and stuff. That was happening out on the street also. Uh, but I was able to keep them to keep their eye on the ball. They had great grades. They went to the college of their choice, and I ended up missing their graduation because of it. Trust me. I wish it would have never happened, but as I said, the courses that I take, and uh, it, it, I hope it helps me more if I run into those conflicts with my kids. I'm not a guy that has conflicts on the street. I don't expect to have any when I, when, when I leave here, but I feel that I'm much better prepared, but more so from I think my, my, my commitment to being a better Christian because uh, I thought I was a good guy. Uh, I had uh, some problems with uh, fidelity <laughs> in my life, but I've, I've always been a guy that pretty much got along with everybody. Are you humbled by this incarceration? Oh, yes, for sure. As I said, I wish it would have never happened. Uh, I uh, was going to start, I didn't know how we were going to do this, uh, by apologizing to the people of Nevada because uh, I wish this would have never happened. I, I apologized to them at my sentencing. Um, you know, there's nothing I can do about this kind of media circus that's going on right now, but I could do something about the whole thing in the beginning. If I would have made a, a, a better judgment back then, um, uh, none of this would have happened. And I, I take full responsibility because um, I should have never, you know, I, I haven't made any excuses in nine years here, but I should have never allowed these alleged security guys to help me because it turned out they were only trying to help themselves. If they weren't there, Bruce and I, we tried to do this. We tried to sit down in the room and call this guy Mike Gilbert and discuss it all, but these guys took over and we were unable to do that. If we were able to do that, you would have never heard about this. None of us would be here today. OK, 
here. And lastly, I'd like you to know that we received hundreds of letters of support and opposition. And while we always encourage public um, input, the majority of the opposition letters are asking us to consider your 1995 acquittal and subsequent civil judgment. However, these items will not be considered in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sisson. I, uh, when we grant offenders parole, one of the conditions of parole we'll, we will impose is to pay court-ordered restitution to victims of the crime. According to the judgment of conviction in this case, you, were, you and your co-defendants were ordered to pay $3,560 in restitution and return 12 Montana lithographs to the victims. Can you tell us the status of the restitution and the return of the property taken during the robbery? Well, one, I was, un, uh, I was unaware of, of the restitution. I do know about the, the, the uh, prints. Um, when I was talking to Bruce on the phone and uh, asking him, was there anything else that should be yours, he said, uh, the cell phone, right? Uh, so I said, do you want to come and meet us uh, with that, or, do you, uh, or, or how do you want to do it? Um, a Mr. Cashmore, now the guy I didn't know, uh, a Mr. Cashmore said, hey, I got to go by that hotel. I'll drop it off, right? I, uh, he testified to this, too. This is not an allegation from me. Mr. Cashmore testified to it. So I say, hey, this guy is going to come back. He's going to drop it off at the uh, hotel. His testimony later was that uh, he didn't remember the name of who he was supposed to drop it off to and that they had decided to screw OJ. We're going to keep this stuff. I mean, this is his testimony in court. The last thing I heard is that he actually tried to use those prints uh, as, um, as uh, um, you know, uh, I, the word, I can't find the word, to get his bail for, for with his bail bondsman. He was trying to use it as, uh, I can't think of the word. So, uh, the rest, restitution. Restitution, the restitution for his bail bondsman. So the last that I know of these lithographs was that this Cashmore had them. I didn't know this guy that he had him, and he testified to the fact in court that he had him. The restitution was paid. I yeah. Let me ask you the restitution was told by my lawyer. Yes. Okay. Yes. If so the, the total yeah. restitution has been paid, and there is no pending? Yes. The property has been returned to the lithographs as well? I, 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 have, I have no idea what this guy is. Oh, yeah, he says that they have been returned to him. I'm sorry, Bruce just signaled okay. me that they have been returned to him. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Um, if granted parole as opposed to completing your sentence in prison, you will be under supervision in the community. Why is it better to be in, com in the community than in the prison? Well, you know, I, I do have four kids. Uh, I miss a lot of time with those kids. I think I am a guy who has always been a given guy. I've, uh, I've uh, even, on uh, even on the street. Uh, people have always come to me. Uh, you know, I, I, my reputation has always been that I'm, I'm open to the public. I'm open to everybody, you know. Uh, I've, uh, you know, I, right now I'm at a point in my life where all I want to do is spend time with my, as much time as I can with my uh, children and my friends and, uh, and uh, I'm not looking to be involved with the media. I've had so many offers uh, for interviews when I've been here in, in Lovelock and I've turned them all down. I'm not interested in any of, in, in any of that. Uh, I've done my time. You know, I've done it as well and as respectfully as I think anybody can. I think if you talk to the wardens them, they'll tell you I've been there. I, I, I gave them my word. I believe in the jury system. I've honored their verdict. I have not complained for nine years. All I've done is try to be helpful and uh, encourage the guys around there, hey, man, do your time, uh, fight in court, and don't do anything that's going to extend your time. And that's the life I've tried to live because I want to get back to my kids family. All right. Do you realize that if you're granted parole, you could be returned to prison for any violation or conditions of parole? Oh. Yes, sir. You understand that? Yes, sir, I do. All right. Now, some be of... easily as not drinking alcohol to excess, uh, associating with ex-felons, leaving the state without permission, being subject to search and seizure. So there's a 
there's going to be a whole slew of conditions you're going to have to follow. And do you think yeah. you can be successful with yeah. the terms of parole? Oh, beyond a doubt. I mean, I haven't drank in nine years. And I, haven't, um, you know, most of my life, I could be stopped and searched whenever they, you know, I, I'm not a guy who lived a criminal life. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a pretty straight shooter. Uh, um, I've always tried to be a good soldier, and uh, um, um, I, 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 I have no problem, none whatsoever, uh, in, in living with those conditions. Here's the other side of that. Um, as an easily recognized person in the community, if you're granted parole, how will you handle public scrutiny in the, in the community? Well, I've been recognized ever since I was 19 years old. <laughs> I'm sure Bruce will tell you, wherever we've been, it's always a crowd. This is not new to me. Uh, um, rarely have I, even even in the last 20 years, rarely have I person give me any negative stuff in the street. I mean, people give you looks and everything, but I'm pretty uh, easily approachable. Um, uh, I've dealt with it. My see any problem uh, dealing with the public. Uh, uh, now, at all. Okay, and Mr. Simpson, we've been, um, since we've been made aware that you're requesting to live in Florida, I've asked um, Captain Sean Arudi to come to today's hearing and explain the pre-release and interstate compact process for us. Um, Captain Arudi is an officer with the Nevada Division of Parole and Probation. He's also the interstate compact commissioner for the state of Nevada, so I'm going to ask him to come forward. And again, these are things that would happen behind the scenes with any hearing that we would have. But because we have a crowd of people that are asking questions, um, we, we thought it'd be best to have um, Captain Arudi present to explain it to everyone. Thank you. I mean, I could easily stay in Nevada, but I don't think you guys want me here. <laughs> uh, no comment, sir. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Captain Sean Rudy from the uh, Department of Public Safety Division of Parole and Probation. Um, as as uh, Chair, Chairman uh, Bisbee shared with you, I serve two roles. I'm, the cap I'm a captain with the Division of Parole and Probation for headquarters, and I also serve as the commissioner for, the ne for Nevada for the Interstate Compact. Um, when it comes to the Interstate Compact, the things that are looked at, is what is your what is your support system in that other state? Do, are you a resident of the other state as defined by the compact, meaning that you were living there for at least a year prior to the date that you committed the offense? Or do you have resident family there that can serve as your support system? And resident family is, is fairly specific, but uh, adult uh, siblings and adult children can serve as your resident family sponsor to provide you with that tie to the other state that would allow you to uh, qualify for a transfer. But that's just the first part of it. First, we have to establish what your support system is and whether or not you qualify for that transfer. And then we make the determination if it's in your best interest to, to request that transfer for you. If, once we make that decision, there's a there's a an offender application for transfer which includes a waiver of extradition which is required to be signed before anyone is allowed to submit a request for transfer to another state what that does is it outlines to you what the requirements of the compact are that you're subject to terms and conditions not only by the sending state which in this case would be nevada but also by the receiving state if you were looking to uh join your family in florida that uh uh, that the Florida would be able to impose conditions on you that would be consistent in the same manner that they would treat one of their own offenders in a like circumstance. From the, uh, once, once that offender application for transfer with the waiver of extradition, and the waiver of extradition serves the purpose that if for some reason you violate the terms and conditions of your supervision, you understand that Nevada has the authority to come and return you to Nevada to answer for those violations. Once, once we obtain that signed offender application, we, we will process that along with the other paper state, and they will then have up to 45 days to conduct their investigation on whether or not, uh, whether or not you qualify for the transfer and whether or not you have a valid plan of supervision. 
Once they determine that, their caseworkers will forward that through their compact office back to the Nevada compact office. And once we have a decision by that other state, then that would be provided to you through, the, through your case manager at the Department of Corrections. That's how the interstate compact part works. On the pre-release side, the pre-release, we have pre-release specialists who work uh, close to the workers at the Nevada Department of Corrections. And they develop, they have to develop a valid plan of supervision. We were talking about what is your plan of release? Where do you want to go to? And we were talking about what is your plan of release? Where do you want to go to? Who's your support system? Once they make that determination, they process the they process the information that's necessary. And in this case, if you our pre-release specialists would be the ones to forward those documents to the other state for their consideration. Then they would work with your caseworker to uh, set up your release, and your caseworker would then manage the release through the Nevada Department of Corrections. Does the panel have any questions for Captain Arudi? I do not. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, Mr. Laverne, I'm, I'm going to defer to the two of you, you and Mr. Simpson. Um, we'd like Mr. Simpson to be able to tell us anything else he'd like to tell us. We'd also like to hear from one of the supporters if, if one of them wishes to make a brief statement to the board. And we would also like to hear your statement, Mr. Laverne. So I'm going to put that back to you as to what order you want those three things to happen. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Sim we're going to hear from Mr. Simpson's daughter, Arnell Simpson, first, and then I'll make some closing remarks. Okay. Um, and Officer Batista, if you will make that switch for us, please. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am, and if you will give us your name and for the record and your relationship to Mr. Simpson. Yes, I am Arnell Simpson, uh, my dad's oldest child of four. Okay, Ms. Simpson, welcome and um, feel free to speak. Thank you. I'm a little nervous, so bear with me. So are we. Um, <laughs> I know it's a lot. Um, <sighs> As you know, I'm here on behalf of my family for the purpose of expressing what we believe is the true character of my father. <sighs> no one really knows how much we have been through this ordeal in the last nine years. Excuse me. My experience with him is, is that he's like my best friend and my rock. And as a family, we recognize that he is not the perfect man, but he's clearly a man and a father who has done his best to behave in a way that speaks to his overall nature and character, which is always to be positive no matter what. He has spent the last nine years in Love Lock, as we all know, and has been a perfect inmate following all the rules and making the best of the situation, which is truly amazing to me under the circumstances. The choice that he made nine years ago that resulted in the sentencing were clearly inappropriate and wrong and counterproductive to what he was trying to achieve. As a family, we were all there to celebrate a wedding of a very good friend. As his daughter, I can honestly say my dad recognizes that he took the wrong approach and could not handle the situation, he could have handled the situation differently. My siblings, I, and family know 
that he didn't make the right decision on that day, but we know that his intentions were not to go in and to just make the wrong decision at the wrong time. Throughout this ordeal, we have remained close. We have stayed strong. And I, for myself, am grateful to God for giving us the strength to get through this last nine years and to stay positive always, no matter what. And a lot of that is because of him. So on behalf of my family, my brother, my sister, an aunt, an uncle, his friends, we just want him to come home. We really do, we want him to come home. And I know in my heart that he is very humbled throughout the situation. Um, this has been hard. Let me be honest, this has been really, truly hard. And there's no right or wrong way to explain how to handle this. But we do know that, oh, I know that he is remorseful. He truly is remorseful. And we just want him to come home so that we can move forward for us, quietly, <laughs> but to move forward. So I thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. We appreciate you being present and we appreciate your comments. And Officer Batista, if you would bring Mr. Laverne and Mr. Simpson back to the table, please. Yes, ma'am. And Mr. Laverne, this would be the time for you and Mr. Simpson to make any of any closing remarks that you'd like to make. What? Thank you, Commissioner. Do you have a copy of a letter I provided uh, through your liaison? It's an undated letter uh, from Mr. Simpson to uh, Assemblyman Osvaldo Fumo. That yes. should have been provided to you. Yes, sir. We do have that as okay. part of the record. Oh. All right. So give me give me two seconds to get set up here because that's that's where I'm going to start. Did you take the letter? I can't find it now. Switch. So. And the letter, as you can see, is very short, so I, I think it would be appropriate just to read it into the record, if, you, if the commissioners would allow me to. That'd be fine. Oops. Okay. But the first thing I have to do is find it. Here it is. The, by way of setting this letter up, by the way, the, the most important about, about part about this letter is that this was not a letter that Mr. Simpson provided to me, okay? Uh, what happened is Mr. Simpson at some point wanted me to communicate with uh, an individual by the name of Osvaldo Fumo. He's an assemblyman now, uh, and prior to that time, and still now, he's an attorney. And in the interest of full disclosure, he actually was one of Mr. Simpson's attorneys uh, during the habeas proceedings related to this case. Uh, but since that time, uh, Osvaldo, or Ozzy as I call him, he's a friend of mine too, he became uh, an assemblyman with the Nevada legislature. And uh, after that, Mr. Simpson sent Mr. Fumo a letter, and Mr. And I found out about that letter not through Mr. Simpson. I found out about this letter through Mr. Fumo when I was advised to thank him for thank Ozzy Fumo for providing some uh, was it books and some educational equipment to the prison here at Lovelock, Nevada. And so here's I'm going to read that letter. And by the way. Mr. Simpson did authenticate this letter this morning. I'd only produced this to him this morning uh, when I got to see him prior to this hearing. He did indicate that he was the one who wrote this letter. And even though it's not dated, he indicated it was probably sent to uh, Ozzy within the last nine months or so. so. Dear Legislator Fumo, first of all, allow me to say how happy I was to hear about your new position as a state legislator, although I was not surprised to hear about your interest in furthering the education and helping of prison inmates. I must admit I've always taken my exposure to education for granted, partly due to my prowess as an athlete. 
I have always been afforded opportunities for higher education. It wasn't until I got to prison that I realized just how many people did not have the exposure to said education, in part because of their circumstances, i.e. gangs, bad neighborhoods, lack of parental supervision, poverty, etc. But Ozzy, I can't tell you how inspiring it is to see how said inmates have taken advantage of the educational department and the advantages that it offers. I have seen a change in some inmates as far as their self-esteem goes that is amazing. They come to me to talk about subjects that they would never or would have never even thought about before their exposure to education. They talk to me about things they want to do when they are released, things they never would have thought about uh, they were capable of before. They say, quote, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, end quote, and as a quote, old dog, end quote, my friend, I can tell you that is not true. I am currently taking a computer science course, uh, or just a computer course that has shown me that even I am capable of learning new skills. These new skills, at the very minimum, will help me better communicate with my children. Who knows, you may even see a webcast or blog in my future. I work in the athletic department here at Lovelock, and I fully enjoy what I do and can tell you this that this is very important for the inmates to have a release for their energy and for recreation. But I can think of no better place to use state funds than to educate, add to their self-esteem, and to prepare these guys for their eventual release. In closing, I want to tell you how much I look forward to the following to following your political career and your participa participation in what I know will be a very successful prison educational program. Gratefully yours, Orenthal J. Simpson. And it's signed by Mr. Simpson. And uh, the reason I wanted to read this, this to you is because, uh, and just kind of surprise Mr. Simpson with it, is because obviously this is Mr. Simpson's, what I would consider one of Mr. Simpson's first opportunities to have clout in the political system of the state of Nevada. He pretty much has an end at that point. He has Ozzy Fumo, who they had an attorney-client relationship with, a very good relationship, and now Ozzy is in the assembly. He's in a position of power. Uh, and what does Mr. Simpson do? Does he say, Ozzy, can I have a better bed? Or does he see, say, Ozzy, uh, can, you get me, can you pull some strings, get me out of here earlier? No. He, he doesn't do any of that. He uses that clout. The one time he has to, some clout in the state of Nevada, he uses that clout to obtain funding for books and education in this prison. Uh, you know, and some of those men, as Mr. Simpson said, they really are going to get out and they're going to have a decent and a better life for themselves as the result of Mr. Simpson's efforts through Mr. Fumo. Uh, I think that's the definition of character. And, and frankly, I think if it was me personally who had been in prison for nine years, and, and frankly, forget nine years, nine days, if I had that opportunity in a position of someone in a position of power, of power who could do something for me like this, I would be saying, get me out of jail, okay? But he doesn't do that. It is very, very, very uh, selfless. He's thinking about the people here, and it's also the definition someone had asked earlier about uh, being humbled in some humility. It also shows a genuine form of humility that he has the capabilities to think of people here who are not as empowered and not as privileged as he has been, and, and, and when he gets out, probably will continue to be in society. Uh, so that's, that's the first part of my closing remarks. The second part of my closing remarks is to deal with uh, the, una or the other individual in this case that was a victim. He's not here. Mr. Fremong is sitting right here. And that's Mr. Beardsley. Mr. Beardsley, as you I'm sure are aware, is no longer with us. He passed away in about November of 2015. However, uh, Mr. Beardsley and Mr. Fremong have made calls to my office, and I've spoken to them both at various points. And the last time I recall speaking to Mr. Beardsley was in September of 2011. Uh, this is not that long after I I'd maybe been representing Mr. Simpson for a couple of years at that point. I was a little uncomfortable that Mr. Beardsley, who is a victim in a case, and my client is considered the person who victimized him, was calling me. So I did explain to him that I wanted to record the conversation. Uh, and uh, he, he consented, and I asked him if he wanted an attorney before he talked to me. He said he was fine. Uh, I, I say this, uh, I, I bring up this recorded conversation because I reviewed it in anticipation of this hearing, and that was from 2011, as I, as I stated before. Uh, 
And since he's no longer here, I think I could just speak from the dead, for, speak from you know, someone who's speaking from the dead. Uh, he indicated in no uncertain terms in that conversation that uh, he had cleared up this matter with Mr. Simpson. Uh, he was trying his hardest to do whatever he wanted to get Mr. Simpson out of prison. And uh, he had just, they had just made it right. Mr. Simpson had apologized to him. Uh, and they had just basically made it right. And he was very, very, and he had sent letters to Mr. Simpson for, and Mr. Simpson hadn't responded, and that was probably on the advice of counsel at the time. Uh, and then also there was another issue of, and Mr. Simpson has raised this issue, and I want to emphasize this again, that Mr. Beardsley had a set of photos, and these are not memorabilia. Mr. Simpson, if he didn't make his point already, he could care less about some signed football or some signed photos. He could care less about it. He could rip them up and burn them up. I know they may, they mean a lot to a lot of people, but those that, that was not what was really the true impetus for what happened here. What was the true impetus for us is that there were intimate family photos that were taken from him, literally stolen. And there is no dispute that these would not be any type of judgment, collections. These are just intimate family photos. Mr. Simpson had a former family. He had a second family. There's pictures of him with his mother and other other things, famous celebrities. And they were not subject to being taken. They, they, they probably have no value to most people, but they have all the value in the world of Mr. Simpson. Uh, they're not footballs, and that's what set it off. And Mr. Beardsley had these photos, or he at least represented to me on the phone that he had these photos. And I had made every effort that I could to try and obtain those intimate family photos that I was well aware of were basically all Mr. Simpson wanted in the first place. Unfortunately, whatever happened, um, Mr. Beardsley was never able to get those to me. He explained that he had them, and I tried to make every effort to give, get those from him. Uh, and, uh, and then at some point along the line, we lost contact, and then I just discovered that he had passed away. Uh, but I will speak on Mr. Beardsley's behalf from that phone conversation that at least as of September of 2011, uh, him and Mr. Simpson had made things right. Okay. And uh, finally... And again, obviously, the commission is not used to hearing where victims are calling people who are in prison their attorneys and having multiple conversations with them. I've also had uh, Mr. Fromong, Bruce Fromong, who's sitting right here to my left and will testify shortly. Uh, he's also called my office. He had called before many years ago, and we had spoken. And I can't necessarily remember the substance of those conversations. They weren't recorded, or if they were, I, can't, I couldn't find them in my files. Uh, but he's recently called again. Uh, he called me on July 3rd, and he called me on July 14th, and uh, both times I missed the calls, but I, I called him back. And uh, I can hear the that Mr. Fromong has made things, and Mr. Simpson have made things right with each other, uh, that he's accepted Mr. Simpson's apology wholeheartedly. Uh, he, he seems to be a fundamentally really, really good guy who's fallen on some hard times recently. Uh, and he, he told me that he would be calling and uh, coming in and testifying favorably for Mr. Simpson. I made sure I told him probably 15 or 20 times to say whatever he wanted to say because, you know, obviously uh, Mr. Simpson's attorney talking to a victim, it could be interpreted the wrong way. So, again, Mr. Fong, <laughs> say whatever you want to say. Uh, nobody's telling you how to testify here. And uh, one of the things we did, uh, and I did inform the parole and probation about both of those conversations on July 3rd and July 14th. Uh, and one of the things that we did spend a lot of time, I mean, that was a small portion of our conversations, was uh, the, the remorse on Mr. Simpson's part that Mr. Fromong accepted. Uh, most of the time we spent, we were talking about some other unfortunate things that happened with Mr. Fromong. I believe, you know, not I believe, I know because I've researched this now. There was some uh, civil litigation that went on out there, and this was against uh, the, one of the, primarily against one of the, uncharged uh, co-defendants in, in this case, uh, a guy named, individual named Riccio. Something happened in this civil litigation, and I, I don't know what's going on with it at this point in time, other than uh, Mr. Fromong addressed those concerns with me. I told him that uh, I would look I into it. I explained to him that he really that should that talk to his lawyers who were involved in that civil litigation to try and make that... civil litigation to try and make that that judgment do whatever he wants it to do and it was it was unfortunate i believe that it, you know this is this kind of is an opportunity to show you that 
Uh, in the criminal case, he's completely the victim, but he filed a civil lawsuit and the jury actually found Fremont 16% liable for what happened here. It was, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty uh, unique, to say the least. In any event, uh, Mr. Fremong is going to testify, but I did feel that I needed to note that I don't think I have a point to prove with Mr. Fremong other than he did represent that he was going to testify favorably for Mr. Simpson and that he did discuss with me uh, on multiple occasions this idea of some civil judgment out there that he was hoping that Mr. Simpson could take care of for him. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Simpson, did you have any closing remarks? Closing remarks? Oh, I haven't heard any except that, you know, I've come here, I've spent nine years making no excuses about anything. I am sorry that things turned out the way they, they did. I uh, had no intent to commit a crime. I came here, I tell the inmates all the time, man, I don't want to hear about your crime. You know, uh, argue in court here, we're all convicts. I'm a convict. Do your time and don't do anything to ex extend your time. I told the ward when I got here, Mr. LaGrange, I think it was, Ms. Carpenter and Ms. Megan, that I would be no problem. I uh, believe in this jury system. I will honor what the jury said, and I will my word. Uh, I, as I said, I've done my time. I, I'd just like to get back to my family and friends, and believe it or not, I do have some real friends, but I think I could have represented, uh, I, I don't think I could have represented uh, this prison. I don't think any inma inmate has ever represented it better than I. Uh, I did my time. I tried to be helpful to everybody. As I said, Bruce, Bruce and uh, Beardsley, uh, I made up with them years ago, you know. Uh, so I'm sorry it happened. I'm sorry to Nevada. Uh, I wish. I wish Ricio had never called me. I, I thought I was glad to get my stuff back, but it's just, just not worth it, and, and I, I, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just one more thing for the record. Your expiration is, as of today, 9-29-22, and for all those people in the world wondering how, how that adds up to 33 years in the state of Nevada, um, Good behavior, um, complying with the rules, um, can percent be reduction off the back end of your of your sentence if granted parole. Um, that September 29, 2022, time could even move closer. So I, I wanted to put that on the record. And at this point, I'll ask um, Officer <coughs> Batista if you will um, move Mr. Laverne and Mr. Simpson again, and um, we invite uh, Mr. Fromong to the table, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Furlong, if you will put your, your own name on the record for us, please, and then proceed. Yes, it is Bruce Furlong. And I'd like to uh, thank the thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak today. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to state that uh, I'm not here just uh, as Mr. Simpson's friend of almost 27 years, um, because that I am. But today, I'm also appearing as the victim of the crime of on September 30th or September 13th of 2007. Um, on that day, I felt that um, Mr. Simpson was misguided, not by himself, but also by Tom Riccio. He was led to believe that on that day there were going to be thousands of pieces of his personal memorabilia pictures of his wife his family, from his first marriage, pictures of his kids, Arnell and Jason, family heirlooms. He was told there were going to be possibly his wife's wedding ring. Thousands of things. He was misled about what was going to be there that day. A man named Thomas Riccio had promised him this big, this big package. In reality, once it, Thomas Riccio had never met me, 
never met me in his entire life until the night of the robbery. He got there and saw all this stuff. He went down, he got OJ. And instead of telling him that that's not what was there, he brought him up anyway. And when OJ got there, unfortunately he was already worked up and had people with him that were hollering and screaming. There's a lot of commotion going on in a very, very small room. <laughs> Real small room, wasn't it, OJ? And um, a lot of things happened very quickly. And unfortunately, if, uh, if OJ had just said, everybody out of here, OJ, Bruce and I need to talk for a minute, none of this needed to happen. But um, that didn't happen. And um, it took, one of the things I want to make clear is that it took me two years in a California court because in um, a judge's infinite wisdom, instead of going ahead and turning things back over, everything got sent to a California court to get straightened out. And after having to fight the Goldman's lawyers, OJ's lawyers, and um, it took me two years to get back with over 600 items. A majority of it did come back to me because I had to go back 19 years through our friendship, but I had to go back 19 years to produce records for almost 98% of the stuff. And it is true that items in that room belonged to OJ. There were no two ways about it. But it's also true that I, had, I have never stolen anything from OJ. I did not, I have never stolen from OJ. I think OJ will admit that I did not ever take anything from you. It wasn't me. An ex partner of mine and his mistress, Christy Lukemeyer, have taken things. Other people have taken things from OJ, but I have never stolen from OJ. OJ is my friend always has been, and I hope will remain my friend. But there were things in that room, and I admit to that. And uh, I'm sorry things did not work out differently. But there were, and I will make this clear to you, OJ never held a gun on me. There was a coward in that room, a man named McClinton came up gangster style, acting like a big man. He held the gun on me, not OJ. Another man came in, hit me, not OJ. He never laid a hand on me. A lot of people are yelling, bag that stuff up. Let's get the, let's get out of here. During the trial, after I'd already testified against OJ, and this is why I absolutely believe him, after I'd already testified against OJ, I'd already said everything I had to say, we happened to pass each other in the hallway, and OJ came up to me and said, can I talk to you for a minute? And we had a chance to talk to each other. And I told him I'm sorry that I, was, I did not get the opportunity to call him and tell him that I had that stuff. Those few items that belonged to him, I told him I'm sorry that I did not take the opportunity to call him because we'd been apart for a long time. We hadn't had a chance to talk for many, many years. And I'd been buying stuff from Mike Gilbert and I wish I had of. And he said, Bruce, I can't tell you how sorry I am. And we've got a saying between us, it is what it is. And he put his hand out, I shook his hand, and I said, I forgive you. We all make mistakes. OJ made his. He's been here, and from what I've told, he's been a model inmate. He's been an example to others. During the trial, I recommended that he served one to three years. That's what I recommended to the DA. And I'm here to say that I've known OJ for a long time. 
I don't feel that he's a threat to anyone out there. He's a good man. I know that he does a lot for other people. And I feel that nine and a half to 33 years was way too long. And I feel that it's time to give him a second chance. It's time for him to go home to his family, his friends. This is a good man. He made a mistake. And if he called me tomorrow and said, Bruce, I'm getting out, will you pick me up? Juice, I'll be here tomorrow for you. I mean that, buddy. Thank you. We appreciate your comments, and we appreciate you being present today. Thank you. Um, and so, Mr. Thank Laverne you for this opportunity. You're welcome. Mr. Laverne and Mr. Simpson, if you'll return to the table, please. Before we w break for deliberation, I want to ask the panel members if they have any other last questions. Anything? That okay. What's going to happen now is deliberation. Again, another thing we do with every single case, but a little differently today because, frankly, we need our offices back, folks. So um, we're hoping to deliberate, um, come to an agreement, and be able to produce an, an order sometime in the next 30 minutes or so. So um, what's going to happen is we are going to break um, if, um, and then after deliberating, we'll come back to this room. I'll ask each commissioner to vote. I'll vote myself if we are able to agree um, when those votes are cast. Um, that will be a final decision. If it becomes obvious that there is a split on this particular panel, I have Commissioners Eddie Gray and Commissioner Michael Keeler um, stand by in Las Vegas and they will either we will call them they will either cast a vote then or ask for deliberate to return to deliberation so that is what we're planning at this moment um, we are about to leave the room um, I know officer Batista is going to arrange to clear the courtroom there also um, I ask that um, here that you give us about two minutes to clear out of the room so that you're not chasing us down the hall and um, then we'll give you a five-minute notice that our deliberation is over and that we're ready to cast votes. So on that, um, I will call this, this hearing into recess, and we will return after deliberation. <laughs>